Okay, a very warm Friday afternoon. Welcome to Reef Conversations 2 with a focus on fish. And uh, first of all, I'd like to start with the acknowledgement to country. On behalf of all of us, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and sea and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also acknowledge that this artwork was commissioned by us, by local Woolgra Kaaba artist, Jordan Wiles. And it also gives you the indigenous name, Gia, for fish in the Woolgaroo language. I'm reporting today on a very exciting development, which was a potential fish indicators workshop, which has been running in Townsville over the last two days. Uh, the first day was in the field, and the second day was hosted at James Cook Uni City Campus. And you can see on this presentation that there's been fantastic collaboration between Dry Tropic Partnership for Healthy Waterways, Great Barrier Reef Foundation, James Cook Uni, Ozfish, Reef Ecologic, and many others. Uh, the outline of this Zoom presentation is we're doing introductions, but we're doing that online. So if anyone else joins, we'll ask them to introduce themselves. Focus on the key deliverables for the workshop. I'll share with you the agenda for day one and two. We'll discuss some definitions, share some citizen science projects that are existing. We'll focus on the Great Barrier Reef report cards and particularly Townsville. Touch on gaps and opportunities. For the people who couldn't attend, give you a tiny taste of the workshop in terms of what sort of tools we used. Oh, and I can see we have got someone wanting to join from Brussels, a previous intern, which is fantastic. And then we'll go to questions and advice. Uh, a little bit about myself. I think you all know me. I'm a fish fanatic both as a fisher, scientist, and a community member. I've worked for government advisory committees and some of the NGOs, including Chairman of the Australian Underwater Federation on the board of Wreckfish Australia and the Fish Names Committee. And I'm happier on the water or underwater, have made thousands of observations of citizen science using a whole range of methods and author, authored numerous scientific papers and reports. Um, the key for this particular project is it was a boost grant, which followed on from an integrated citizen science grant that Reef Ecologic and Reef Check Australia were awarded for the Townsville region over the last three years. And we identified one particular tool that we wanted to look at a little bit more closely, um, particularly for looking at a possible link between citizen science and regional report cards and the gaps for marine and estuarine fish metrics. As part of this, we wanted to further engage traditional owners, pilot a method for reporting, and most importantly, engage the community. Um, the agenda was jam-packed. Um, as I said, the emphasis, first of all, was getting people out in the field. And we got a great diversity of people and they all got in the water. Many of them took photographs and added them to iNaturalist for the first time. We went out to Jungbaden, Magnetic Islands, for a five-hour tour and uh, then came back, entered the data, talked about it, and it's been amazing what we saw. Not only some common species, but there was also quite a rare porcupine ray, which, believe it or not, I've never seen, which was quite fascinating. And then today, building on that field experience, um, it was all about the people in the room sharing knowledge, learning, and having some workshops. Um, the key segments were bringing everyone up to speed on some definitions, what has been done in citizen science with a focus on fish, what has been done with regional report cards, and then looking at the challenges and opportunities um, and the way forward. And as I said, I'm particularly pleased to report on the last two days in a timely manner with this community presentation tonight. Um, day one, a couple of photos. 
beautiful, flat, not quite as clear as it was in this photo, but an intrepid team got underwater using a range of cameras and GoPros and saw some cool things. Um, here's some of their observations. Golden Trevally, Black Spotted Cod, Square Tail Mullet, Snappers, the little RG green symbols at the top are research grade observations. So people throughout the world have already helped people identify some of these species. And there's now over 2,000 observations just around Jungman. And, and here's some of the top ones on the right, the gold striped butterfly fish, the Chinese demoiselle, and the Bengal sergeant. And of course, the very obvious and charismatic lemon damselfish. And day two, you know, the facilities at James Cook Uni are fantastic. Um, this is Cara presenting on the report card. And I'll just point you out to that banner in the background. We emphasised it's all about people and empowering people to make a difference, to learn, to contribute to their community. Um, we focused on fish and I surprised a few people that two of these three images are fish and one isn't. And the one that isn't is the one at the bottom, the sea cucumber. And many people don't know that sharks are defined as a fish. Um, they generally think of them just as, as bony fish. We also talked about a definition of citizen science, which involves public participation in collaboration with scientific research to increase knowledge. And the Queensland government chief scientist has a strategy which involves participation from students, the public, scientists to increase awareness. So again, just emphasizing that it's all about people and getting them involved. And the growth in citizen science in recent years has been huge to the point where citizen scientists are now making more observations than traditional scientists. And whether that's due to COVID, whether that's due to new technologies, um, we heard today about some of the amazing successes of other apps, such as the Frog app, that have recorded over a million observations. And I should also acknowledge that it was great to have Professor Steve Turton from the Australian Citizen Science Association flying up from the sunny coast to attend our workshop and share with us what they do and their strategic review. Um, the big focus was on this particular tool called iNaturalist. It is the biggest citizen science app in the world, over 200 million observations, hundreds of thousands of people involved. It really is easy. And there has been a project led by the Australian Museum called Australasian Fishers. And we fit under that project. And you can see some of the key partners there, including CSIRO, museums, and even tiny little reef ecologic down there at the bottom. So it's all about collaboration. And I also created an umbrella project using iNaturalist projects in Queensland. And there is a lot of them. Some of them are very broad, covering all of Queensland. Some of them are very specific, focusing on taxa, such as corals, fish, mollusks, sharks and rays. Some of them are events that only go for a week, such as reef blitz. And some of them are traditional owner-led, such as the Wapa Alley Sea Country iNaturalist project. And we also looked at other fish science. And this was quite an interesting one from the Great Barrier Reef Outlook Report. And if you look at the Townsville region, you're looking from inshore, mid-shelf to offshore. And it just shows some of the patterns and trends of fish abundance, which would also reflect with fish species, where you have less inshore, medium in mid-shelf, and more offshore and trying to take that into account in our thinking. Um, I shared a quite unique traditional owner state of sea country project, which was based on a expert assessment and using names such as gear for fish. And again, this also looked at the comparison between fish health, between inshore reefs, offshore reefs and islands and the traditional owners thought they were generally poor to good. 
And of course, the Gabrumpa Outlook Report is put out every five years. They separate bony fishes and sharks and rays. But the general story is status of bony fish over time is good but declining. And status of sharks over time is poor, was declining, but is currently stable. And that we have limited evidence for those grades and trends. And of course, there's a number of other groups who've been doing some fantastic, but to some extent, under-recognised work for over 40 years. And one of these groups is InfoFish. They've done a lot of work around Gladstone Fitzroy catchment, but they are responsible for working with recreational fishes, particularly on tagging of inshore and estuarine fish. Um, so Bill Sornock provided me with this infographic around fish tagging, data reliability and activity for the Townsville region. And Ozfish is also one of our partners in this project. They do a number of monitoring using traditional nets and they're also now working with some eDNA um, and there's a lot of potential for us to collaborate with them into the future. Here's an example of eDNA. Um, we did a project during a recent Australian Geographic funded citizen science exhibition of the Great Barrier Reef and Coral Sea. And you're looking at a wheel of life here. And the technology is quite amazing. You collect a water sample, send it out to the lab, and it shows you the species of fish and mollusks and worms and so forth within that region. But when we compared it to other techniques, including iNaturalist, there was some similarity, but some differences. And generally the feeling was that there was a lot less species that were reported with eDNA. Maybe that's because it's a new technique. Maybe it was the sampling replication and we'll see how that develops over time. Um, the other thing in a lot of these slides, I put a local fish and we just asked the workshop participants if they could recognize that. And I'm gonna put Phil on the spot and ask him if he can have a guess at the name of this lovely little critter. And if you can't give me the Latin name or the common name, I'm happy to have the family. Well, I'm gonna say it's definitely a damselfish. Uh, it's one of the farmers and Adam, it's too long since I've spent so much time in the water under the reef for me to recall all of my um, uh, genera and families. So um, let me say a damselfish. Yeah, damsel's fine. And it's a Bengal sergeant. Sergeant because of the stripes. They're quite a cheeky little critter. Um, we also talked about Reef Life Survey, which are a great citizen science group that was started in University of Tasmania. It's basically scientists or really heavily trained scientists that do this. I think I'm the only one in Townsville who's trained to this level. Most of them focus on temperate reef fishes and a lot of them talk in Latin. They don't talk in uh, common names of fish, but they do some great work and we love to collaborate with them on using citizen science and report cards as well. And Cara, I'm gonna hand over to you to talk to these next three or four slides, because this is your area of expertise. Oh, that's a bold statement there, Adam, <laughs> but thank <laughs> you for handing over. Um, so yeah, um, for, for those on the call that don't know me, uh, my name is Kara. I'm the Executive Officer for the Dry Tropics Partnership for Healthy Waters. And um, one of the products that we produce each year is a, a, a snapshot, I guess, of the current receiving environment's health. So we put this, we synthesise all of the available environmental data from numerous partners. Um, in the dry tropics alone, we have about 24 partners. Um, and I will just say not all of them are data providers, but a vast majority of them are data providers. And we amalgamate all of that available monitoring data on a range of different parameters. So whether that be fish, whether that be mangrove, seagrass, corals, 
uh, water quality, looking at things like uh, nutrients, sediment, et cetera. And we synthesize it into a single technical report uh, and we publish all of our methods for the analyses as well in a methods document. But the technical report in itself is still a 230-odd page document, and unless you're really keen on, you know, understanding the details of every single site that is analysed within the dry tropics region or the absolute know-how about how these grades were analysed, um, most people are looking for a snapshot, and that's where the report card comes into play. A report card is a communicative tool um, which looks at all of these technical grades, uh, sorry, these, these technical data and synthesizes them into a, a grade, similar to what we received at school, where whether you're an A plus student or, or a D, I'm not going to judge. Um, but the idea is that everybody can relate to that A, B, C, D, E grade and we know that something that's receiving a D or an E even um, it needs help it's a system that requires some form of management action because there's something in that system that's going wrong and that's where the technical report uh, comes into to play but you can read a bit more about the specific grade that's in question um, to figure out what it is in the system that's causing the issue uh, but if we're seeing A's all around for, for a particular system, then it's pretty safe for decision makers to focus their resources, such as uh, money or time, um, into a different area because whatever it is that they're doing is working. Um, so it's also, I guess, evidence for a continuation of successful projects in regions as well. Um, that's all. Yeah. So um, our data that we receive is um, it comes under the microscope, I guess, from quite a rigorous scientific uh, two different scientific panels, actually. So we have our technical working group and our independent science panel, and they have um, standards who are standards that must be met for the data in order to be included into our report card. So it is quite a rigorous um, rigorous standards that for data for inclusion into our technical report and then our broader report card. Um, and we might just go to the next slide. But at the end of the day, like the partnerships, so we, uh, the Dry Trappers is just one partnership, but we want to be able to tell that story. There's, there's no point um, to environmental data sitting in spreadsheets or in databases because then it's not able to communicate to those decision makers, including the community, about the areas which do need those management actions. So we want to see that, um, all of the available monitoring data in the region included in our report card so that we really can understand that holistic picture about what's going on in our receiving environment. Um, and that's just, so Diane Tarr is um, our technical working group chair and she does also sit on the independent science panel. So she's quite a knowledgeable lady and uh, credit to her for, for her statement about um, the fact that environmental data doesn't belong just in spreadsheets. Um, and, and so as the Dry Tropics Partnership, I will just say that we're one of five. We are the youngest um, or the baby out of all five of the regional report cards. We've only been in existence since 2018 with our first report card in 2019. But there are other partnerships that stretch across the entirety of the Great Barrier Reef catchment region. Um, and they are all at, at different levels of maturity in regards to what, uh, how many partners they have and what kind of data they receive as well. But the idea is that the report cards in each of these regions, they feed into larger decision-making tools, such as the Reef Water Quality Report Card, such as the Great Barrier Reef Outlook Report. But what the, the benefit of these niche regional report cards provide is that really in detail, um, fine-tuned, um, locally specific 
environmental data and feeds into those specific and um, decision making and management actions that need to occur at those really small scale um, environments such as specific waterways or specific basins, um, which you can't really delve into when you're looking at something that does extend over the entirety of the Great Barrier Reef catchment region. Um, and I can talk to this one if you like, Cara. So yep. I suppose one of the things that I noticed with the previous record cards is that there was a lot of unknown information for fish and not only for the dry tropics, but also some of the other areas. So Townsville's got seven zones. Two of them report on fish. They're the freshwater areas. Uh, wet tropics, Mackay also have lots of areas of fish that they don't report on. Gladstone report on quite a few, but they haven't got a lot of offshore areas and Fitzroy report on all of them. Um, and you can see these gray areas in the box, which basically says not enough information. And again, I've already shared with you, there is a lot of information out there, but there hasn't been the opportunity to bring it together or synthesize it in a way or have it to meet the criteria for the various technical or independent working groups to have confidence that it has value for management. And certainly most of the people that I talk to, they're mad keen on fish and birds and beer. And although we can't do anything much on the second two, we can do something on fish. So that was the purpose of this report card to explore how we might be able to fill those gaps. Um, here is just showing it again, that particularly the marine and the offshore, we don't have any information at the moment, but it's a great opportunity. Um, the workshop talked a lot about how they measure freshwater fish, and there's an acronym called POIS, which is the proportion of introduced species expected. So just as an example, if you've got a river such as the Ross, and you have good baseline data that said there should be 80 species there, and your report card sampling detects 41 year, 20 the next, and five the year after, that's a proportion that you can measure and talk about. And the report card is quite forward looking and recognizing that it is a journey, and depending on resources um, and priorities, it would be great to have indicators for fish in some of these other regions. I will also point out that there was a really good body of work done recently, which was a reef citizen science data assessment that was done by RPS. Uh, they looked at numerous data sets, but particularly Reef Life Survey, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, Reef, Eye on the Reef, and also Reef Check. And you can see a lot of these projects have been around for a long time, between eight and 25 years, but none of them quite fitted the bill for one reason or another. Uh, you can see also that there's a very different trend. Reef check largely report on a couple of iconic species and then groups categories such as herbivores or groupers. Reef life survey look at individual taxa, but don't get to a lot of sites very often. And we also in the workshop tried to learn from other projects and particularly Gladstone, which has been around for a long time and been reasonably well resourced. And it was fantastic to have Professor Ian Gordon, who was the chair of the Gladstone Healthy Harbours report card. And one of the scientific papers that has been published a few years ago now talked about design principles and challenges. But we talked about the really need for strong links to all stakeholders, rigorous science, effective communication, setting clear goals, flexibility, transparency, et cetera. And sometimes the, the challenges between the two, particularly sometimes rigorous science and simplicity for communication, and you need both. Then we had a bit of a go at some workshops, and I'm not going to go into detail, but we tried to put some scenarios up, such as what if. Um, what if we use the same methodology, the poise methodology for freshwater fish, as we could use in the future for inshore marine and offshore marine? What baseline would we need, et cetera? 
And I won't go into that any further at this stage. Um, as part of the workshop preparation, we created a number of umbrella projects, not only for the whole of the region, but also zones to show that there were almost 10,000 iNaturalist observations of which there are almost 8,000 research grade observations. That is observations that have been verified by two other experts. And during the workshop, we also found out that the confidence in those identifications was around 98%. So it can be highly trusted. Here's what it looks like where most of the data happens from the offshore region in the dry tropic partnership for healthy waters region. And that's largely because it's the biggest area. And that's where most of the snorkelers and scuba divers to date have been recording data. But there are also large amounts of data from around Yungbanan, Magnetic Island, and Gulbudi, Orpheus Island, and very scarce data from the freshwater areas. And that's largely because they're not areas where you snorkel or scuba dive, and also because we have not engage the recreational fishers and others to report on what they're catching in those regions. So I feel that's a great opportunity that we identify. Um, we looked back over time at the data set and recognised, although iNaturalist has been around for more than 10 years, it's only been in the last couple of years that there's been large amounts of data available for our region. And it seems like that trend will continue going forward. We also looked at the comparison of species. That's the bottom black line for our region with 404 species versus effort and tried to get a handle on the confidence of the data and how many observations you would need and discuss that perhaps 500 observations would give you 50% confidence in the data and 3,000 might give you 95% confidence in the data. And intuitively, that makes sense. And we also had a bit of a play with what ifs using very different scenarios and report card metrics to see what it might look like to just check if it might be real or might not be real. And getting towards the end of the presentation, I'm just gonna share two of the tools we used. One was called a SWOT analysis, strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, which looks at now for strengths and weaknesses and looks at the future for opportunities and threats. And we looked at that not only for citizen science, but also report cards with four or five different groups. And we'll collate all that data, share it back to the participants and interested individuals as part of the record for the workshop. And the sixth workshop, believe it or not, we did six separate workshops today. It was very busy. We compared a number of indicators, such as sensitivity to change, readily available and accessible, robustness, relevance to report card audience for the current collection of data for fresh water in our region versus a proposed collection into the future just to see where the similarities and differences were. And finally, I'm going to um, ask Professor Ian Gordon if he would just like to share in a brief way um, some of his insights because, Ian, you did the, the wrap up with the group before we go to questions and next step. Thanks, Adam. That's a really good um, tour de force in terms of putting across what we did today it's and yesterday. It's been, it was a, a really engaged group that uh, did a lot of work to help and support, bring their ideas into the conversation around the ways in which a fish indicator might be brought into the dry tropics um, partnership. Um, I'll just briefly say that I, come from the Gladstone Healthy Harbour Partnership, as Adam said, where we have um, had a fish, have, have had fish and mud crab indicators for a while. And in large part, that's because of the fact that uh, the Gladstone Healthy Harbour Partnership report card came out of a significant event that happened in 2011, um, where there was a confluence of a, um, a major, major rainfall event with um, a 
dredging that was happening in the harbour and uh, the community of Gladstone, who I think are the highest proportionate boat ownerships or tinny ownerships of any um, place in Queensland, uh, got concerned about the, the health of the of the of the um, of the fish in the in the harbour because they were using it for recreational fishing. And so we've got these indicators of uh, particularly in relation to fish health and fish recruitment and the health are uh, and um, and sex ratio of of mud crabs that are key are are fundamentally driven by the needs of the communities for understanding the health of the harbour in relation to the ways in which they use it. So the questions I think what we need to ask are the ways in which um, the dry tropics um, community would um, use information that there was around a fish indicator and what the indicator might be. So for example, it may not be in relation to fish diversity, but it could be in relation to specific abundance of specific species, for example, like coral, coral trout. Um, so I think the thing that the things that, that came away for me were um, really about understanding what it is that uh, the community are after in terms of the ways in which fish indicator is reported within the report card of the of the dry topics partnership um they also that there's a lot of inf uh, a lot of effort gone into things like i naturalist and um it obviously meets a need for the community the question is what is uh, the is the um value of the data to a thing like a report card especially given the fact that we have to be a trusted and independent science or evidence base to support decision makers and community understanding of the health of the, of the system. Um, they, the, 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 um, I think the thing that is really, citizen science I think has a significant role to play in the ways in which report cards develop over time. Um, we see that with the litter index, for example, that is used in, in a number of our report cards. And um, I think there are ways in which we can bring indicators like fish in, uh, uh, an index of fish into the report cards in the other regions apart from um, in, in the Gladstone Healthy Harbour. And it'd be useful for us to be able to do that in a way which is, um, uh, which is, um, re not repeat representative across the range of different report cards, such that we're able to make comparisons across those and we'll have learnings from each other. So the workshop itself today was a really valuable one. I congratulate Adam, uh, Jacinta, and the team for the work they did in putting the report, uh, the um, the workshop together, and the way in which it flowed. I also congratulate the the members of the of, uh, of the, um, the workshop participants that were there that um, engaged fully and provided their, their in insights and, and in intellect to the process. And we ultimately learned a huge amount in a very short period of time. So it was a, a, a tsunami of information and evidence and support, but um, it's, it was a, a day very well spent. So thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Ian. And we'll now just throw it over to questions or observations or next steps. And for particularly the people who didn't come to the workshop, um, over to you. Who'd like to start? Rochelle, how about we start with you? Anything you would like to um, add or any observations based on that presentation? Uh, well, first of all, good job and great effort from everyone. It looks like you covered a heck of a lot of ground in two days. Um, I think some things to think about are for people who are capturing data at different sites and across time, it can be really easy to stop making observations of common fish because you see them so often, they're not as exciting. 
but I think it's important for good data to make a point of of actually capturing them each site each time you go out because that does give you a good baseline of what species are the most common and so on. And as well, just keep in mind when looking at the data, certain species may be common, but may be much harder to spot and some may be uncommon, but people are excited. So they take pictures frequently and upload it, even if they're not as common as other species. So just things to keep in mind when looking at the data and when going out to collect it, some of the observer bias that can happen. That's a great point, Michelle. And we did have a very good conversation about effort. And some of the discussion also talked about limiting effort to particular times, like we do for activities and events such as reef blitz and great southern bio blitz. And that might help with the rigor to get through some of the technical working groups. Um, I'm going to hand up uh, Al next, and then Ageth, and then Phil, and then open to anyone. So I just keen for everyone to have a say. You're all really important people. You've allocated some time to turn up tonight. So we want to hear from you. So Al, Ageth, and then Phil. Yeah, I've just got uh, two quick questions. One is uh, relating to what Russia already mentioned. With uh, When it comes to confidence in data, you mentioned that if there's, um, let's say, 500 observations, it's somewhere around 50%, or in 3,000 would be 90%. I think that would be a bit biased against rare species, who's uh, probably present, and probably 10 would be high, considering how rare they would be in those areas. But if we limit ourselves to a certain number of observations for the I, I don't know, I don't have the right answers, but I think that's something to consider. And then and my next question is probably, uh, is, is related to Kara's presentation about the scorecards. Because I've been, uh, I've been working on uh, a lot of scorecards in the past, even, uh, even in vulnerability assessments or, or any assessments that involves scoring or low, medium, high. And my always, um, my questions all, all the time is uh how do you how do you uh set the parameters how do you say high is high of course aside from the obvious answer that's uh literature based on literature but some parameters just don't have you you, you just can't find them in literature like uh, how do you agree on what's high and what's medium and what's low yeah. And look, Al, we'll talk in detail, but again, the workshop had a great discussion on the importance of independent baseline data and comparing your data set, whether it's iNaturalist or something else, to that, um, but recognised also that there are shifting baselines and different methodologies. But once you agree on something, it's important to try and stick to it so that you have that rigorous method over time. Thanks, Al. Um, all the way from Brussels. Again, I'll, I'll just very quickly, quickly um, touch on that, Al. We also, because we are so regionally specific, um, it is quite common to get uh, experts who are really fine tuned into understanding the exact environments in which we're, we're operating over. So by having a baseline data set, um, whether it be trends, of iNaturalist or, you know, published data from, you know, re reputable journal artic uh, journal or, or wherever the, the baseline data set comes from, having those experts who have worked within this very niche field, within this very niche environment or region um, to corroborate those, those gradings and then have that agreed upon through two separate um, experts so technical working group and then independent science panels who are also then experts in their field at a, at a national international and regional standard um, is where we kind of get our our grades from as to what we would need to see within a system for it to be considered you know poor very poor good very good or moderate um, and that's where the, the grades are kind of determined and each of those are determined for different parameters separately. Thanks, Cara. Um, hello again. 
Hello, it's great to see you all. I hope you're all doing good over there. It's summer here. It's still a bit winter and and cold, but it's good to see you all. I was wondering, um, I've worked with eDNA for my honors project, so I was just really surprised to see you just mentioned that there's things that weren't picked up on with the eDNA samples. How come? How do you? What do you think could could play in that? Look, it's early days, but it could be that some of those huge diversity of species haven't got their particular genetic typing in the data set, but it could also be that you're collecting EDA from water samples and there might be such a tiny part of eDNA that isn't picked up from the water samples. So it's still a work in progress in terms of comparison. Mm -hmm. It might also be that it's just species that haven't been described or um, things. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Too. Thank you. Uh, Phil, any comments, observations, questions? Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> I'm just interested to um, to hear what the workshop might have imagined the, the, uh, the iNaturalist um, citizen science can be used as an indicator of. Is it, is it, is it about diversity of species? Is its presence of or absence? You know what, what, what is the what? What did the workshop think the best application for look, that? What, what what would it be an indicator of? Look, it's a great question, Phil, and we did look at quite a lot of other methods that did do abundance, but the poise indicator that's used for freshwater is based on pretty much species richness or diversity. An iNaturalist is also set up for species richness or diversity. So it's not the be all and end all for everything, but that's what we thought would be possibly appropriate to consider. So potentially an, an element along with eDNA and other things to, to build up that, that species richness exactly. indicator. And we did also talk about having one pony is good, but having two or three or having two or three different methods is a lot better. And Gladstone currently has three different methods to measure their fish health, but it's also better to have some data than no data. And at the moment there's no data. And even some of the data is only collected every three to four years. So we thought it would be good to have a discussion to see what we could do to build on educate the community, and then leverage it for future improvements over time. Thank you, Adam. I think I, I've, I've been an enormous, um, uh, right, right from the, the 1990s when I was spending days and days and days in a row in the water when, in my tourism days and sharing observations and you know, you really, you really switched on to what's going on out there, and 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 you know, occasionally being frustrated with with that observational data being, um, you know, uh, not valued, I guess, in the in 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 the, in the sort of upper end of of academics and scientific rigor and things like that. So. I commend you and, and and the dry tropics for you know undertaking this initiative. I think it's a great opportunity to to look at how we can sort of melt all of this stuff together to to get the outcomes. I mean, there's a lot more people out there paddling around in the water and diving and snorkeling and fishing than there are you know scientists applying rigorous um, scientific procedures. And I understand that that's what that though that rigor is there for you know to cover, but I think there's great value in exploring this further, Adam, and I and I look forward to uh, contributing more when I have the opportunity in the future. Well, look, thank you, Phil. Thank you, everyone, for attending this Zoom. Um, particularly those who attended after a full day of workshop. That's true dedication. Um, we'll call a halt to it now, and I'll stop the recording and I'll share this. But let's continue to collaborate, uh, share our ideas, our passions for the future, um, for report cards and fish and the community, and look forward to working with you all. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. You too. Thanks, Thank you. Good to see you again.
Bye. Bye, everyone.